Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Today is sermon number 42. As we progress along in our complete Holy Bible reading of the King James translation, if you have been, uh, and many of you are, I'm sure, are reading along with other translations, uh, you probably see some differences in the wording sometimes uh, in how it isn't just a matter of grammar, in, although the King James is, is sort of a, had its own style that was right for its day but is a little different than what it would be considered normal today. But apart from that, words that translators have used, because some, sometimes translators have agendas, you may have noticed that. Uh, even the King James itself is dated uh, as a matter of things that it used, uh, where it used candlesticks when in fact they were lamps. The candles were common in 1611 England, just as lamps I'm sure were, but they translated them as candles. But apart from that, there are differences, and again, the, the importance of reading more than one translation, because if you, it sort of, they sort of level each other off, where one is a little, little too high or too low, as a matter of the accuracy. And he, and the Hebrew and Greek speakers, they they will debate it just as much. Being a, a native speaker isn't that's not going to solve the problem. There are many people who have decided they're going to go and learn Hebrew and and really get it right, and that's that's a a, a noble effort, but you'll find it's a big effort. I mean, just learning, getting used to the Hebrew alph alphabet, which is not the Roman alphabet that we use in English, and the same thing with Greek. The Greek alphabet, completely different. Uh, just getting beyond that, where you're comfortable and, and, and capable and able to proceed along there and the, and the pronunciations and everything. But you probably have noticed some differences, but if you read more than one translation, it evens out. As it happens, we can only read one at a time. I've read a number of translations over time, and I, I've never really had a problem with the extremeness, if that's the word, of, of any one particular translation, and, and because I've read others. And if you, those who have done the same don't get excited about it, it may be a curiosity, it may be something to take note of, but it's not something to get worried about because you, you understand the context, and that's the main thing. Concordances, the use of concordances, they're very useful for, for some things. You just need something very quick, but to sort of build to build doctrine on. And many people do that. They, they want to know everything about a particular word in the Bible, and that's good. And they'll use a concordance to do it. And that, along the same line of what we're talking about, different translations, that word may not even be in or used in some other translation, and not wrongfully or, or with some evil intent, but just because the word, another word, is just as good or better, just as appropriate, and you won't even find it in in your own search using the concordance. It's good if you want to know, you know, something very quick, to, but to gain full understanding, you've got to read the Bible, because even the word itself may not be expressed, but the principle is is obvious to you as you read through it. And you can make notes from that. And that that really, if you really want to understand the Bible, uh, read it. That's, that's, there's no other. There's no nothing as good as that. Nothing. No other alternative that will get you the understanding that you need. And as well as you will learn as you go along. Many people have expressed 
uh, as I've been hearing from, even people who've read the Bible a number of times, have come across things, as we've mentioned here, little things, that it was so obvious, they say. And suddenly, there it is. And it's like in reading the end of my nose all this time, and I couldn't see it. Well, I have those all the time. I know exactly what you're talking about. Because with each reading, you, you learn more. It, you know, the understanding will grow with you. I mean, that's that's appropriate. You know, it's, it's like someone who's learning to ride a bicycle. You know, you don't get them a, a, a $100,000 racing bike for someone who's just learning. And it's the same thing with the understanding of the Bible. There's no price tag on the Bible, but there's that value and depth of understanding because it will grow with you. And again, the reason for that, it makes sense. You know, it's the same as you don't give someone who's just learning uh, something that is going to get fallen over and scratched and broken and everything because full understanding before we're ready for it. You know, doctrine and truth can get fallen over because if you're not, if you don't have the depth yet, you're not really going to be able to make good use of it for yourself. Whereas later on, because it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an effort. Trying to obey the Lord in this world, the problem shouldn't come from the Word of God. It, it'll come from the world. I mean, that that's that's normal. I mean, that's, everybody's had that problem through the ages. We're not new in this time. Some of the things now, perhaps, uh, the only difference now is that with the internet, perhaps. The whole world can have access to you, just as you can have access to the whole world, figuratively speaking. So more people, you know, it's not like back in the olden days, a new pioneer country where you never saw another human being other than your own family for maybe months or not. Uh, that may may have been a good thing, but it also would have been a bad thing because look at the information that's available to us now with things like the internet or libraries, book libraries. So you know, it, it, there are disadvantages and advantages, but Every generation has had the same ability, the same availability of learning enough to repent and living the life that is required for that repentance in order to get to salvation. So it's not it's not a problem. Everyone is going to have that opportunity and chance. And those of us who have it now have to do something about it. And we are, as best we can. People who want to argue they just they just do. And you know, before our, our conversion we know we know what it's like. Don't we? I mean, be honest about it. No one was born knowing the truth or being able to do anything about it. Again, the reason why why adults are baptized in the Bible and, and little babies aren't. You know, little babies they don't they don't have much to repent from of their own, and they they aren't really capable of doing much about it anyway. How can a baby live a Christian life? How can a baby be judged for good or for evil? It's only after they've lived their life for a while, particularly after the time of conversion, when they know the truth, as in they, as in all of us, and what we've done about it. Because that, then judgment starts from that day on. Because you can no longer say, well, I didn't know that. And right now, a lot of people, they don't know that, just as we did. But when you do, well, then judgment is running. The clock starts ticking from that time on. And, you know, we, we mess up, we're humans. But on balance, we do the best we can. And sometimes... Even when you fall down, I mean, Satan, he's going to open up on you. Just as soon as you try to obey the Lord, things are going to start happening that probably didn't before. He'll use family, he'll use employers, he'll use all sorts of things. But you just do what you need to do. And you'll get, get through it. It's not, it's not an impassable, impassable or impossible task that we've been given. You know, look at the Messiah, what he was given, and how, as it went along, the temptation of Christ, how, um, and that, that lesson there, I think the reason it was recorded. Satan, in, in a way, he's so, he's so intelligent, but he, he's, he's dumb. He, he makes really dumb mistakes. Apart from his rebellion, but things that he did, the incitement of trying to kill the Messiah as an infant, that was right. I mean, it was evil, but it, as far as Satan's perspective goes it was right but when the crucifixion came satan should have been doing everything he possibly could to prevent that sacrifice because with that sacrifice came the authority from god to knock satan off his throne of this earth he should have been doing everything he could be he just so twisted he just couldn't resist himself apparently because he, he should not should not and even i think you can see little flashes of that that's not just my opinion for example, when, when 
the Lord told Peter he was going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. Peter said, oh no, Lord, never, no, not you. We never let that happen to you. And the Lord turned and he didn't say, Peter, he said, get behind me, Satan. Get out of the way, Satan. Shut up, Satan. Because Satan was thinking. He had, he had, his, he had a rational moment then. But later on when he entered Judas and all of that the involvement of it, he lost it again. He should have been. He, he understood it. And, you know, you read the Bible a few times over, you realize that, and just the result of what Christ did, we'll put the link on for what happened when Christ arrived, arrived in heaven, the delivery of that blood sacrifice as fulfilled as a fulfillment of the prophecy of, of a day of atonement, entering the most holy place with his own sacrificed blood. He was then given the authority to rule. Everything, everything from that point on is under his rule, subject to him. He hasn't claimed all of it yet, as you can look around the world and see, but everything, except God, came under the authority of Christ, because he's going to return and put everything under his feet, so that when all that has been completed, he's going to turn the kingdom of, we'll to put the study on for that, the kingdom of the Lord God, that's the first stage of it, over to God, and then God is coming to the earth, with the link on for mission accomplished, and how that, it's all there, and we're all a part of it, if we Stick to what we know to be the truth, as best we can understand it. Translations, you know, they're not perfect. Even if we did understand them perfect, we couldn't obey them perfectly. It goes together. But we have enough knowledge and enough awareness and growing, and we're expected to grow, to let our light shine. And even that, you know, it isn't just a matter of not hiding your light under a basket. You know, what happens if you if you remember uh, science class in high school or something, what happens when you put a candle in a closed container? It goes out, doesn't it? It needs oxygen. It has to be out in the open or else it dies. The light doesn't just become hidden. It actually goes out from lack of oxygen. It has to be in the open to give us light or else it's going to die. You know, the du duality even of that lesson, a lot of people miss that. They think you just let your light shine, but... You have to. Once you've got it, if you don't let it shine, it's going to die. You can't hide it. It won't survive if you hide it under a basket, under a container. If you stifle it, if you try to stifle the light, you actually extinguish it by hiding it. And we don't want to do that, which is the reason we're reading the Word of God. Some actually uh, had been, I actually just got back to this, I had been reading computer Bibles. Um, but I've been using a paper Bible, a real Bible, a book Bible, for this, and it's kind of nice. A lot of people are concerned, you know, um, with the technology of today. I read an article about that recently, in that how books, a book that was printed 500 years ago, you could still pick it up today, if you're allowed to touch it, because it would probably be very valuable and, and all that, but you can pick it up and read it, if you know the language in which it was printed. It was your language. It was printed in German. You could read German or English, whatever. Whereas technologies, computer files that were produced today, are they going to be readable 500 years from now? All the data that's being produced. I mean, just think about it, because every time you get a new computer, how often do you have to upgrade not only your the software that runs it, but the files themselves? Imagine if you had if libraries had to throw out all the books every five or ten years and have them all reprinted in the format of the day. And really, that's, that was the, the gist of the article. And I think he had, it may have been a little extreme as far as he was taking, but he had a point. I think that it's, it's dangerous, I think. A lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of knowledge is going to be lost because what if the technology is not there to read it anymore and people didn't bother to, to upgrade their software to, to make the to make Microsoft or somebody else another billion dollars a year. And really that's what it's about. It isn't, isn't improvement as much as it is just business. It's, it's built in. It's like cars that, you know, they could be made to last a long time, but they're not. And, you know, software is the same thing. I think it, it, it's, it's not the same as books, as, as a book book. And even, again, even the, as we read in prophecy, you know, the irony of that, you know, no one is more modern, ultra-modern than the Lord. And, when Christ returns, he's going to be holding a scroll, as a matter of prophecy, a written scroll. 
it's an archaic old scroll, but you know, it's going to be it in the future. So you're going to have a, a laptop or a notebook or some sort of handheld device? Not according to the book, he's not. So I guess he want, when something wants to last, you actually have to print it. Judges chapter 19, we're getting now to the end. Uh, we're about to begin the book of Ruth. We'll get to that today which is sort of a, a nice uh, break or interlude between the book of Judges, which is a very brutal, uh, savage time in Israel's history. They've certainly had before that time and after that time. But it was sort of, they were in their own country, but what made it an exception or notable is the fact that they could not really blame it on other people anymore. They were in their own country. They were in the promised land. They were given... The land, secure borders, the Lord would protect them. They really didn't need an army anymore as a matter of being able to take on any anyone because the Lord would fight for them and with them in a number of cases, as we, as we read. But they just kept going corrupt. They would just get there and they would just become sort of full of themselves and forget that the Lord had given them everything and that that was given to them, that grace, if you will, was given to them based upon their obedience to him. And, you know, where we heard that before, that's, that's pretty much the state of the world today, the Christian world today. They believe that grace is this their gift. All they have to do is claim the name of the Lord or the name of Jesus and that somehow grace is theirs, the gift of eternal life is theirs, no matter how they live. And it doesn't work that way, not according to the word of God. According to the word of man it does, but the word of man is wrong. And that's going to become quite manifest, I think, as time goes on, as a matter of really the spirit of this world, people are going to come to recognize things. I mean, as, if you have been converted and begun your Christian journey, do you see the world now differently than you used to? Can you recognize things that seemed so right and so righteous and so bright? And they may, probably were, because, you know, it isn't, as I mentioned, I think, last week, it isn't a struggle between light and darkness. It's a struggle between light and evil light. Because Satan, you know, he was he was beautiful. He was bright. He was the light bringer. That's what Lucifer means. But he became evil. His behavior became darkness. His, his behavior was not a matter of his appearance. Two very different things. And a lot of people don't see that. You think if it's pretty and it's shiny, well, it must be good. Well, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And in this world, the odds are it isn't, because the world right now is not not yet what's going to be when the Lord returns. And so there they were. They were just living this up and down, around and around cycle of they would have a deliverer delivered to them by the Lord. They would be good for probably the rest of the lifetime of that particular deliverer. And then when he died, or she died, there were female deliverers, Deborah, for example, they would fall right back into their pit of idolatry or savagery or just lawlessness, and so the Lord would withdraw His defense of their of their nation, permit people to spill over the border, and take them over. And you know, it wasn't just a matter of their military power, because it, there's nothing that says that the Lord made them any more strong militarily before, during, or after whatever the state of their attitude was toward him. It was just a matter of when when they became away from the law, walked away from the law, they just became weak. They just either couldn't get themselves together, like Satan, the example I used in at the beginning there, he should have been doing everything he could to prevent the sacrifice of Christ rather than involving himself in it. And he would have these little flashes, as we said with the example of Peter. And yet, he just didn't. And these people, they were like living in this, this little wonderland they created for themselves, rather than the land that was delivered to them by the Lord. And it was just, everything just turned into a mess for them. And they just weren't up to it, even though they were strong. And when a deliverer would come, then he would sort of get them back on their feet again. And so it would be good. And it just up and down and around and around. And the end of the book of Judges, that we're about to read, it was just as gory, just as lawless, just as typically human, as a matter of humans who are away from God, who turn their back on the Lord, of the savagery that's there. Judges chapter 19, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, 
who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now stop. What's the what's what's the problem with that? Where there was no king. Well, there was a king. The Lord was their king. But they turned their back on him, so they had lawlessness. They were in a state of rebellion. And so everybody did as they did. And it came down to a matter, well, he's got the biggest club, or he's got the biggest gang, so he's right. Until somebody else comes around with a bigger club or a bigger gang, then he's right. And that's how it went on. Whereas the Lord is right, and that's the way that was. And they lived in peace. As we'll get to, for example, after the book of Ruth was, was really laying the groundwork for the birth of that family, there came stability because king simply means head of a kin. In that way, Jacob was a king because he was the head of his family. In Jacob's own lifetime, he never had a country named Israel. He was a foreigner all his life. He was born in the land of Canaan. He lived up in Syria for 20 years as a foreigner. He came back to, to the land of Canaan with his family, who were all Syrian-born. He then went over into Egypt, where he died, lived there as a foreigner, was buried in the land of Canaan, in Hebron, as a foreigner. The only the only actual land they owned was was the grave site that Abraham had purchased for Sarah in the land of Canaan, at Hebron. So he never knew it. But he was a king in the sense that families, the head of a kin, was a king. And families sometimes grew into large cities. So the, you can hear the term, read the term king of a city. Sometimes they grew into beyond that, beyond their city borders. They became a country. So the, that, that father, that patriarch, from which we get the word patriotism, that's how it originated, would grow into a, a country. They were already a nation. You, you don't have to have a, a country or borders to be a nation. Nation just means nativity. In that sense, Jacob did have a nation as his own people. But as a country, he didn't. He just didn't. And these people now, they were there, but they didn't have a king. Even though the head of the patriarch, whoever that would have been, that actually should have been a king legally, technically, customarily. But he was either ignored or not strong enough or whatever. Or just if he was on the down cycle, he wouldn't have been much of anything. He could have been anything. Just, he just was not a leader. He was not there to be responsible, and it wouldn't have mattered if he did, because nobody would have followed him. Everybody would have just were doing as they pleased. So the reason, again, the problem that they were having was of their own making. They weren't just poor little things, all these big bad foreigners out there getting us. Well, no, they weren't. They were strong, but they were weak within themselves, and, and that's how it grew to an outside problem, because you know it's that inner weakness morally. You can have, you know, be able to bench press 400 pounds, but if you're morally weak, you're a loser. And that's really what it comes down to. And their country was the same way. They may have, may have had a very strong military, but look at them. They were living in chaos, fighting each other. As we'll read here, a horrendous act of atrocity committed within Israel. It wasn't some foreigners doing it to them. Continue. Verse 2, And his concubine played the whore against him, and went away from him unto her father's house in Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her, and to bring her again, having his servant with him, and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he bowed with him three days, so he did eat and drink and lodged there. And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And they sat down and did eat and drink, both of them together. For the damsel's father had said it unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. So they were on a three or four day drinking feasting party here. And, you know, it was a very serious matter, getting this marriage back together. But the father-in-law, he was either stalling, which he may well have been doing, not wanting his daughter to leave, or probably getting, trying to encourage, encourage the man to leave without the daughter, but as we'll see, whatever. But they were, they were just partying. That's what they were doing. Verse 7, And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. 
And he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried till afternoon and did eat both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draws toward evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth. To an end, lodge here, that thine heart may be merry, and tomorrow get you early on your way, that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem, and there were with him two asses saddled, his concubine was also with him. And when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn in into the city of the Jebusites, and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. And to interject there, that's correct. Jebus was uh, actually a foreign city to the Israelites until after, uh, after the civil war in which which is far yet into the future as we're reading this, from where this is being recorded, it was only taken by King David after the Civil War. During the Civil War, Saul was headquartered up into the north, up in Samaria. David was down in Hebron. Nobody even wanted, even thought about it. They weren't fighting over the capital city of Jerusalem because it wasn't the capital city of Israel at all, of either side, either one of them although it was certainly uh, positioned to be so because Saul was of Benjamin, he was a Benjamite, and their territory bordered on the north of the city, and David was of Judah, and their territory bordered on the south of the city. And actually they met, the tribal territories met at Jerusalem, so it could very well have been, but I guess they were just so tied up, encumbered fighting each other that they didn't have yet time to take on the Jebusites in the city of Judah. Jebus, which is as it was known then, and they didn't really have an easy time of it. It would have been a battle even when David did take the link on for that. But he found a way in that saved them a big battle, and he was able to breach the city's defenses. And I, I have no doubt that he fixed those breaches so that someone wouldn't, wouldn't turn around and do it to him again, because there's nothing recorded of that later on of, of someone trying it. Verse 13, And he said unto his servant, Come. Let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night, in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodging. And to interject there, the reason, biblically accurate, correct, all the details are there. As we said, Benjamin was the, to the north of Jerusalem. They had Jerusalem as their southern, one of their geographic border points, whereas Judah was from the south. The reason after they split into Israel and Judah, the reason, prime reason, I'm sure, why Benjamin was inclined to remain with the king at Jerusalem is because their territory bordered on Jerusalem. It was natural for them to do that. Verse 16, And behold, there came in, there came an old man from his work out of the field of Eben, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto him, we are passing by Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that receiveth me to house. Keeping in mind this man, as we read at the first, was a Levite, and the tabernacle, which contained the Ark of the Covenant, was up in the north. It was up there in Samaria, kept up there all that time. It never was moved, really, for three or four centuries uh, until such time that David brought it to Jerusalem after David captured Jerusalem, or as Jebus, as we said 
earlier before that time. So, but he, was he a really good Levite? Was he faithful and serving the Lord? Well, we'll read on here, and you you might think not. Continuing, yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid and for the young man which is with thy servants. There is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee, howsoever. Let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house, and gave provender into the asses, and they washed their feet, and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about, and beat at the door, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. Stop. Where have we read that before? Exactly the same thing. Answer, Sodom. Exactly the very same thing. And yet this is Israel. The very same thing. That just shows what in their morality had descended right into the sewer. The very same thing is, is there. And, you know, the lesson of what happened, it, they just didn't learn it, did they, very well. And so we continue. But you can see just what of a, a state of affairs the country, their society, so-called, had become. They learned nothing beyond what their own little, to them, history was their own lifetime, uh, which is sort of typical of humanity anyway. But their lessons of the past, of Sodom primarily, Verse 23, And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine, them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you, but unto this man do not so vile a thing. Now stop there. We sort of had our hopes up there for a moment, didn't we? That this man was a righteous man. And he was protecting them from these these people, these Sodomites of Israel. But look what he just said. Now, he was going to turn his daughter and the man's concubine and just throw it to these animals out there. You know, and out, you know, there's a sort of a righteousness there, but his own. It was his own righteousness, wasn't it? Just as evil. They were, evil was facing evil. Verse 25, But the men would not hearken to him. Now stop there. Why would that be? They didn't want the two women. They wanted the, the men. So, Sodom again, continuing, So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her, and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. Stop and wonder what he was doing in there all night while his concubine was being abused. Like that. Not much of a man, is he? Not much of anything. Verse 27, And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman his concubine was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it, there was no such deed done, nor seen from that day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt. Unto this day, consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. Question, was she dead when he decided to cut her up? Or was he the one that actually killed her? Because she came back to the door after being abused all night. So well, there we, we sort of had our hopes up for him, too, at least... A little bit after he was clear of it, but what? Again, to see how far they went when the law of God goes. There is nothing that people won't do. Literally no evil. The limits are, There are no limits when people turn the back to the Lord. But it, I'm sure he was thinking he was doing the righteous thing. He was going to make a point, wasn't he? 
in his own self-righteous mind. Judges chapter 20 Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the people, even of the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, Tell us, how was this wickedness? And, the, and to stop their absolute hypocrisy, it's like many countries in the world today, very same thing, committing absolute atrocities all over the world, but they, in order to deflect that, they'll point the finger at somebody else. And this is all this was doing. Keep in mind, this is the era of the judges. There, there was no righteousness there. And there was obviously none in this sort of an example. And the response that they're about to have here, again, it's just a matter of absolute hypocrisy. Verse 4, And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came unto Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night, and thought to have slain me and my concubine, have they forced that she is dead. And to interject there, who killed her? That isn't stated. Verse 6, And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. And again, to inject to his own, the way it's stated there, it didn't say, I took her dead body. It says, I took her. Verse 7, Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your, give here your advice and counsel. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do in Gibeah. We will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we will take ten men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand and a thousand of ten thousand, to effect victual for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man, and the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribes of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Israel of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the seas unto Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities twenty and six thousand men that drew sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. Now stop there. Was that necessary? There was obviously an atrocity committed. They had apparently no sense of justice. If they weren't going to turn it, it's understandable. They didn't want to extradite, if you will, Benjamites from their territory into another territory. You see that in the modern day. People uh, here in Canada being extradited from one province to another or in the U.S. from one state to another, or internationally from one country to another. The principles there then, but they should then at least have dealt with the atrocity that was done, and they didn't. They were looking merely to cover it up. Nobody is going to tell us what to do. Never mind the fact that of the, the, the rotten crime that was committed, that just was no longer a matter of principle anymore. It was a matter of we're going to do as we please, and we can't be wrong. We're, we're just righteous, and that's all there is to it. But if you read what happened, it, that certainly isn't the way it was. Verse 16, Among all this people there were 700 chosen men, left-handed, everyone that could sling stones at an hairbreadth and not miss. And to interject there, as we said, they were strong militarily. Heavily armed here, you could stone throwers, very accurate, very good sharpshooters, marksmen. But so what? They were morally rotten to the core. So what? What good was their power? If they were rotten morally and had turned their backs on the Lord, and the reason that this entire purpose for the judges. Verse 17, and the men, and to interject there, what they're about to do to each other. 
Verse 17, And the men of Israel, besides Benjamin, were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of war. And the children of Israel arose and went up against the house of God, and asked counsel of God, and said, Which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Now stop there. There they were still going up to the lower house of the Lord. The Lord told them, Send Judah. Now why would that be? Could it be because Judah and Benjamin's territory bordered each other? Could that be it? And the fact is that they went and asked of the Lord now in such a way, and they got an answer, which is even more amazing. But continuing, And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day twenty and two thousand men. Stop. The Lord told them to do that. But they got whipped when they went out there. So who was, was, was the Lord taking sides there? Or was he delivering his wrath upon them simply by letting them have at each other? Because the force that he sent out there against them, if they had been truly of the Lord, they wouldn't have lost, would they? They never did before at any time in the history. But when they mockingly looked to the Lord, well, sh what should we do? Where should we go? Look at the result that's happening. Verse 22, And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and, and wept before the Lord until even, and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day, and destroyed down to the ground the children of Israel again. Eighteen thousand men, all these that drew the sword. Stop? How could that be if they weren't just as bad? You see the point? If the Lord had, had really sent them to carry out his wrath or to carry out justice, they wouldn't have been defeated, not once, but twice, repeatedly, and yet they cried to the Lord. And how many people today in the, this evil world will cry to the Lord, supposedly, pray to the Lord for success in whatever it is they're lusting to do, and the result will be something similar to this. Verse 26, Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of the Lord was there in those days. And to interject there, as we said, the, ark, the tabernacle was still up in Samaria, up in that area. Verse 28, And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. And Israel set liars in wait about Gibeah. And to inject there, got to be a pun, right? Liars in wait. But you see how much the wrath, and if you add up those numbers, what's about to happen to Benjamin here, and, and the number of people, troops that Israel lost, add up the numbers and you can see what the Lord was doing. He wasn't picking sides on anybody. But keeping in mind they had a, a very, Israel, all the tribes together had a massive army, and the evil that was done there, or as a matter of trying to defend someone, it's like someone refusing to extradite a murderer, while at the same time refusing to charge them in within their own territory. That's really what it came down to. But the Lord was dealing with it, not just against those who had done it. It's, it's The whole thing was, was bad. And yet they were still there praying to the Lord. It's, it's amazing they didn't quite catch on the first time. Because if the Lord had truly been on their side as a matter of the side of their evil, which of course he isn't, they wouldn't have lost it all the first time. They wouldn't have needed a tenth of that many men to go out there. But now that part was accomplished, so here we go. Verse 30, And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day, and put themselves in array against Gibeah, as at other times. And the children of Israel went out against the people, and were drawn away from the city, 
and they began to smite of the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth up to the house of God and the other to Gibeah in the field about thirty men of Israel. And the men of children of Benjamin said they are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said let us flee and draw them from the city into the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal, Tamar, and the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah, and there came again Gibeah ten thousand men, ten thousand chosen men out of all Israel, and the battle was sore, but they knew not that evil was near them. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamin that day twenty and five thousand, and an hundred men, all those that drew the sword. And to interject there, as we said, there it was a double punishment that was brought forth and within Israel itself. But you know, they still had the tabernacle, still praying to the Lord. They didn't quite, as I said, they did, they obviously didn't get the message because they went out on the third day. And it was only the Lord's will that they didn't get whipped again, as a matter of how they, what happened to the first two times. No, never before at any time was the Lord ever sent somebody to do something according to his will, according to his purpose, and lose. And yet that's what happened to them twice. It wasn't a victory that they were headed out for. Verse 36, So the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites, because they trusted unto the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And the liars in wait hasted and rushed upon Gibeah, and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait, that they should make a great flame with smoke rising up out of the city, and when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill all the men of Israel, about thirty persons, where they said, Surely they are smitten down before us, as in the first battle. But when the flame began to rise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed. They saw the evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them, and them which came out of the cities out of the cities that destroyed them in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them, and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin eighteen thousand men, all these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Rimon. And they gleaned of them in the highways five thousand men, and pursued hard after them unto Gidom, and slew two thousand men of them. So all that fell that day of Benjamin were twenty and five thousand men that drew the sword, and these were men of valor. But six hundred men turned and fled to the wilderness unto the rock Rimon, and abode in the rock Rimon four months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin, and smote them with the edge of the sword, as well as the men of every city, as the beast, and all that came to hand. Also they set on fire all the cities that came to. And keep in mind, these are Israelites in their own country. It wasn't a matter of being invaded by a foreign enemy. They had simply turned inward on themselves. It's like a heavily armed country that just turns on itself, within itself because it had become lawless. The strength that was there was being squandered against each other. And the Lord, you know, as we said, it's an amazing example here of a civil war is really what it would have went on. If it had gone on longer, it would probably have been called that. And again, the Benjamins involved in it, considering later on when David and Saul were really a civil war between Benjamin and Judah. But look what happened. The Lord wasn't fighting for either side here. He was bringing his wrath upon both sides. And it was just a matter of how they just followed along. They did obviously didn't have the leadership to realize what was happening. Because if they got whipped the first day after the Lord told them, then there was something wrong. They were doing something seriously wrong. Because if you're with the Lord, the Lord's with you. 
He's not going to send you out and get defeated. And they got they got defeated twice. And then the third day, the wrath was brought upon Benjamin. It couldn't have it couldn't have worked the other way around, could it? Because Benjamin was smaller. You can see that the logic of it is just perfect, absolutely perfect. The Lord was was bringing his wrath upon them, just as he had done really throughout all the book of Judges. The only difference in, in this particular example is that the punishment, rather than letting the Philistines do it, typically it was the Philistines because they were very strong, as in, for example, Samson, or the Moabites, or somebody. And ironically, Ruth, as we'll get to, was a Moabite. She was from what is today the kingdom of Jordan. But in this example, it was within, they were, the invaders were actually the Israelites themselves. It was an intertribal holocaust that they were bringing upon each other. But both sides lost as a matter of the number of men, now, men of valor, the best fighters, they they both lost. Judges chapter 21, last chapter, the book of Judges. Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. And the people came to the house of God and rode there till even before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore and said, O Lord God of Israel, why is this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? And to interject there, why would they even ask that? I mean, they know what happened. They know they're the ones that started it. They went out to wipe them off the face of the map and that they were asking that. Verse 4, And it came to pass on the morrow that the people rose early and built there an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel that come not up with the congregation unto the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that come not up to the Lord to Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And stopped there. They did it again. They, they know very well that Gen Benjamin wasn't about to come because they were at war. And they just, they were at war. And yet they make proclamation that whoever doesn't come is going to be put to death. So they were practically guaranteeing another war. But, verse 6, And the children of Israel repented them for Benjamin their brother and said, There is one tribe cut off from Israel this day. How shall we do for wives with them that remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them of our daughters to wives? And they said, What one is there? of the tribes of Israel that come not up to Mizpah to the Lord. And behold, there came none to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For the people were numbered, and behold, there was none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. And the congregation sent thither twelve thousand men of the Palantist and commanded them, saying, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the children, and this is the thing that ye shall do, ye shall utterly destroy every male and every woman that hath laid by a man. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead four hundred young virgins that had known no man by lying with any male. And they brought them unto the camp to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. And the whole congregation sent some to speak to the children of Benjamin that were in the rock Ramon, and to call peaceably unto them. And Benjamin came again that time, and they gave them wives which they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet so they sufficed them not. And the people repented them for Benjamin, because that the Lord did make a breach in the tribes of Israel. And to interject there, no, he didn't. They made their own breach from the Lord which caused them to turn upon themselves. As we read, verse 16, Then the elders of the congregation said, and again to interject there, there right there is an example, if you were using a concordance, it could bring you to that verse. But what if you hadn't read the chapter leading up to that verse? Would you get a correct conclusion? If it said there, The people repented them for Benjamin because that the Lord had made a breach of the tribes of Israel. If you hadn't read the whole chapter, would you get a different view if you'd only read that verse? 
it, it says something very different, doesn't it? Because what they were doing is they were putting their own spin on it. Their own spin on it. They were saying something that they just didn't have the righteous perspective to be able to see for themselves. They were in a, we can't do any wrong. We can do no wrong mode yet. And yet they were. They just couldn't see it. They were so full of themselves, of their own, their own supposed righteousness, that they just couldn't see that they were the cause of their own problems. They were giving lip service to the Lord. They would pray, as they did. He sent them out to get whipped twice in battle. And then when that, was, that side had received its punishment, he sent them out again to deliver his wrath on the other side. And they just seemed oblivious to it. And why? Why would that be? Was that a surprise? Because they were made themselves oblivious to the Lord. They couldn't hear it. They couldn't see it. They just couldn't. Couldn't. And uh, someone who was righteous, the irony there, and it's not really an irony as much as it is to simple justice, a righteous person would have been able to see it. But a righteous person wouldn't have been in the position where they would have had to be in that position. So you can see this, like the basket example. You don't just cover up a lamp to hide its light. You, you don't cover it up because it'll die. The light will die from lack of oxygen. The, the duality of the Bible is amazing. Verse 16, Then the elders of the congregation said, How shall we do for wives for them that remain, seeing the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? And they said, There must be an inheritance for them that be escaped of Benjamin, that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel. Howbeit we may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn, saying, Cursed be any, be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin. Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh, yearly in a place which is on the north side of beth the Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south to Lebanon. Therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards, and see, I, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances, then come out ye out of the vineyards, and catch you every man his wife out of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. And it shall be, when their fathers or their brethren come unto us to complain, that we will say unto them, Be favor favorable unto them for our sakes, because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war, for ye did not give unto them at this time that ye should be guilty. And the children of Benjamin did so, and took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught, and they went and returned unto their inheritance, and repaired the cities, and dwelt in them. And of and the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family, and they went out from thence, every man to his inheritance. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that single verse, that single sentence, says it all. It's surely true there. How they were just living, but it was a righteous, in their own eyes, lawlessness. Just like the world is today exactly what they're doing. But some of it, it's almost laughable if not, the, if not for the goriness and the tragedy that kidnapping people for wives and all of that, carrying them off, the absolute madness of that society that they had created for themselves. And none of that would have been if they would have simply followed what the Lord told them to do. But they just didn't. A lot of people criticize the Bible. It's, it's very gory and it's very brutal and everything. Well, not according to what the word of the Lord told them to do. It isn't. But when they make themselves into that, well then, the wrath really was of themselves. The Lord's wrath was delivered simply by letting them have at each other, which is what they happened. But, it, you know, again, the world, people will look back at that ancient time and say, well, brutal savages back then, but, you know, look around the world today and it's no different. It's the same thing, the same sort of righteousness. People pray, praying and crying out to the Lord for success in their evil. It's the same thing. And it's going to remain that way, unfortunately, until such time that the Lord comes and, and puts an end to it all by bringing his truth to the entire world.
And as we'll read now, beginning in Ruth, that family, as it began to blossom, it began actually with Abraham, that righteousness. The promises were made to Abraham, but there had to be a messianic line begin to be born from there. And King David was another key factor because the righteousness was from Abraham. He was the forefather of that righteousness. But the king, that part of it, the reigning king of Israel as an ancestor of the Messiah who would fulfill it ultimately for the entire world, a spiritual Israel, the coming out of the world and following the king of Israel, overcoming, and really that's what the word Israel means, to struggle with it, to struggle with man, with God. Well, the man really, that if you're a Christian, the one you're really struggling with first and foremost is yourself, man as in his species, Adam, which was in the Hebrew word means both male and female. Eve was as much Adam as Adam was, to name there. But they, if they would just follow the Lord, and the example, you know, you can read, read this and really just look around the world and see it today. Same thing. But that's the part of overcoming. Because if you don't, you're going to be reliving a lot of what's in this book. Moving now on into the book of Ruth, sort of a breath of fresh air compared to what we've been going through here with Judges. The, it certainly doesn't have the gore uh, and the, the sin and the, the evil that and the carnality that, that we have read in all of that. It's about a very righteous woman who, ironically, was not an Israelite. Perhaps that is a, a glaring example of how so-called Gentiles... It's not the first example, by the way, because there is, of course, Abraham, who was what would be today called an Iraqi. Uh, Ruth would today be called a Jordanian. She's from over what is today the kingdom of Jordan, Arab kingdom of Jordan. So it isn't, you know, it, these examples keep getting sort of thrown in Israel's face because although they were given to be a model nation, they didn't live up to that model very well. And it's true that, that Satan was throwing everything he could at them, and the lesson is there as well. Spiritual Israel, the church in this world as it is, example is there as well. How oftentimes the true church of God uh, is made to look as bad as it possibly can, simply because it's being hounded, pestered, set up, baited by Satan, whereas the, the false churches of this world, he's not going to bother with them. He's going to make them look just as nice as can be. And you know that's that's an example. The the difference here with Ruth though is that she was genuinely righteous and she wasn't an Israelite. That's the part you have to keep in mind. And there are other examples, as I said, not just of Abraham alone. I mean, he's the giant of the matter of righteousness and faith, which, by the way, to him meant obedience. He did what he was told. He didn't just sit sit there like a bump on a log saying, "I'm saved." You know, and he, he he did everything the Lord told him to do. He was there at home in, in in Iraq, and the Lord told him to get out of there. We're going to send you to a new country, uh, and not where he would be the new country. The, the new country never happened in his lifetime, just as it didn't happen in Isaac's lifetime or Jacob, Israel's lifetime. You know, Jacob never lived in Israel as a country. I mean, the irony of that, he's going to. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be in the kingdom of God, but they didn't in their lifetime. And part of the reason that it's going to exist in the time of the future is because that Messiah was born of a particular tribe and of a particular people, as well as recovered also in recent studies. You know, that Judah himself, the first Jews, were from a Canaanite as much as they were from Judah. Actually, two Canaanite women. What does the Bible say about Canaanites? And how that, it just keeps coming back, the lesson is there, and yet so many people ignore it. So the people of Judah, well, they're the chosen people, and they're so holy, but they're not. The, the only thing holy about them is that they were set apart for the sake of the coming one of themselves out of that family who would be the Messiah of all people, including everybody who existed prior to the time there were any Israelites around, including people like Noah and Abraham and all the righteous people of that time. But the book of Ruth, is, it's, it has its tragedy in the beginning in, in that she became a widow, but the thing is, she, people die. I mean, it wasn't the goriness that we read in the book of Judges. And it was from her becoming a widow that she moved to Israel and married a righteous man of Bethlehem and formed the basis of the family from which King David, and then centuries later, the Messiah would be one. So it's a nice, it's a nice read. It's a, it, 
It's a matter of righteousness. It's a matter of looking at something, a situation in which someone really lives a matter of righteous life in themselves as a matter of choice, as a matter of really so much a part of one world or the other, putting the link for the two kingdoms, children of the two kingdoms, you become a part of whatever it is that you live by, the spirit by which you live by. And there is that contrast. And we'll put on the link for as well, you know, what lights your walk? You know, and who who lights your walk? But we know who's lighting Lu Ruth's walk. Continue. Ruth chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and certain a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Melon and Chilon, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab, how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband, if I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now stop there. There's a clue right away about Ruth's character. She recognized the Lord. And that was probably the primary reason that she wanted to remain with Naomi, because Naomi had sight of the true God. She, she spoke of the Lord, whereas Orpah wanted to go back to their gods, which means idolatry. So you, can, so you can see there a difference in the character of the two women. Verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. And to stop there, there's the key, right there. That is the reason, that is the reason that Ruth became one of the ancestors of the Lord God when he was born as a man. And just consider that statement. We'll put on the link for who is the Lord God because you can see that she looked to him. She was looking to him. She didn't seem to know all that much, but she understood him to be the true God. He was not an idol. She didn't want to go back to that. But she understood it, and by understanding, by recognizing him, she became one of his physical ancestors when he was later born as a man. Verse 17, Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. 
when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, but Merah, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again, empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? And stop there. She was obviously in a state of grieving, because, she, as she said, she was elderly at that time. Her husband had died, and that's the natural way of humans. The Lord wasn't somehow picking on her. Her elderly husband had died, and he had gone the way of all humans sooner or later. And, you know, considering the time that they were living in, which was actually still within the, the time of the judges, he's lucky to have gotten old, because a lot of them didn't make it, as we've been reading. They didn't get past youth, military age. So he was very fortunate. Verse 22, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. So there they are. They're back there now. That would form the basis, that return. And again, you can see how the people, even then how the Messiah of all nations, that was not something that was sort of an afterthought beginning after the, the Gospels or in the, into the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Well, you're going to take the Gospel to the, take the, gospel to the, to the Gentile world. Well, no, it began with the Gentile world because in the sense that it began with people who weren't Israelites, as with Abraham, or even going back to Noah, if you will. He was a righteous man. He was saved for that reason. So, you know, it, it, it begins where it begins, if you read what it actually says about these things. Ruth chapter 2, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And to interject there, they had, if not for employment itself, there was the law as a matter of going over crops. You don't, whatever spilled or dropped or whatever left, you don't go back a second time. You leave that for the poor. It was sort of a welfare system, but it was a matter also that those who were helped also had to go out and work to get it. So it wasn't just a handout. They actually had to work. Verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Stop there. You can see the character of Boaz as well. Verse 5, Then said Boaz unto his servant, that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? And the servant said that was set over the reapers answered, and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. And to stop there, she didn't have to ask, it was already the law. Assuming the law was being observed, and these were righteous people of the Lord, so obviously it probably was, but she asked anyway. And the fact that he allowed her to do it was, again, shows it was a righteous house. Verse 8, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. And again, stop there, keeping in mind, this was during the the wild times of the judges, he was telling her, don't go anywhere else. I mean, we just read about what happened uh, with Benjamin in the war there and what happened to that woman. Boaz was saying, her, saying to her, don't go, don't go elsewhere. Stay here. You're, you're safe here. And you can see the Lord had directed her to that place. Verse 9, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charge the young men that they shall not touch thee, and when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So again, a warning, don't anybody hurt her, or you're going to be dealing with me. 
So he, again, the righteousness was there, and the fact that he had to say it completely covers what we've been reading in the book of Judges, and as we just read in the final chapters, we, chapters that we read there, he may have actually had that incident in mind. The warning was there. We'll leave her alone. Verse 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz said unto her, It hath fully been shewed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come into a people which thou knowest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, unto whose wings thou art come to trust. And again, right there is the key. Right there. And keeping in mind, she was a foreign woman from Moab, and this was during the era of the judges when the Israelites themselves, most of them, there were obvious exceptions, such as Boaz, but they were just lawless fools, as we've been reading. But here were righteous people, truly righteous people, not just in their own eyes. Notice that every time they speak of righteousness, they spoke of the Lord, His righteousness, His law, His way. Verse 13, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly, Unto thine handmaid, do I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens? And Boaz said unto her, At meal time come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and did eat. she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. So there was the matter that typically the law, and he was obviously observing it, they were to leave as they harvested, they were to leave whatever was spilled or whatever was missed for the poor, but he ordered them to let her pick at the forefront with, with the regular reapers. She wasn't just picking, leaving them after that time. Verse 16, And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So he was ordering, to interject, the reapers to actually harvest and give her some harvest of the, of the actual harvested grain. You can see what was coming there. Verse 17, So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out what she had gleaned. It was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave it to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And he shewed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, the man is near kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And again, to interject, he was a king. He was like he he wasn't obviously the highest one here, but he was. That's where the word king comes from. Highest kinsman. It was like a family encampment. The highest kinsman would be the king. It, it was like a title. Some families would grow bigger, so the, the, the encampment would grow into a town or a city, so they'd be like the, the king of the city, and we read of that in the Bible. Some would grow beyond that in more prosperousness as a matter of their population, such as happened to Israel, and they would become a nation or a large territory within that country. And you can see there how it grew from that. And the same principle applies to spiritual Israel in that God is our Father, the ultimate patriarch, and how it grew from that. Verse 21, And Ruth the Moabite said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with, thy, with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. And to interject there, she was obviously talking about the wild things that we were talking about 
that we read about prior to this time. As I said, this is still in the book of, of Judges, the era of Judges. Verse 23, So she kept her fast by the maidens of Boaz to clean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So again, you see there how the righteousness is rewarded. The choice of an ancestor is being is happening right here because it, that's what happened. And how she was brought to Mary, eventually, as we were about to read. And how the Lord was choosing his ancestors. He he chosen Abraham for that reason. Declared unto Abraham, it is through you that the Messiah will come. In effect, saying, it is through you that I will be born as a physical man. The choice of King David, same reason. And the ancestors of King David, as we're reading here right now. The Lord was choosing his own physical ancestors. Ruth chapter 3, then Naomi. Her mother-in-law said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whom whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put on raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known to the man, until he sh shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. And she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his fam heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet, and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter, and then at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part, but if he will not do the part of a kinsman unto thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman unto thee, as the Lord liveth. Lie down until morning. And she lay at his feet until morning, and she rose up before one could know another, and said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. And he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said unto me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou knowest how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. And so he did. After all, through that we'll continue on next week. But you can see there how the basis, and isn't that a, just an amazing, sort of like a little oasis of peace and righteousness? Because as we read at the beginning here, this was still within the era of the Judges. It certainly isn't the book of Judges, but it was certainly a, a different a different sort of situation. And yet we, we read of it, and how it's concerned, don't, don't go out to another field, don't... Uh, be very careful, and he ordered his people to look out after her as well to protect her because it was just a lawless time. The difference is that Boaz here was a truly righteous man. He was looking to the law of the Lord and living according to it, and it was for that reason that both he and his about to be wife, Ruth, would become ancestors of the Messiah. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. 
Until next week when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.